The excitement of sports lies in the uncertainty of the outcome, of watching the drama unfold before your eyes. At its most thrilling, the space between victory and defeat can be a matter of inches or in tenths of seconds. Sometimes it's both, and the result remains in dispute. The 1974 Ohio State-Michigan State contest was one of those games, and its final seconds will frustrate Buckeye fans for eternity. November 9, 1974, East Lansing, Michigan. The undefeated and top-ranked Ohio State Buckeyes versus the upset-minded Spartans of Michigan State. A Spartan stadium crowd of over 78,000 witnessed what many observers still call the most controversial climax in the history of the Big Ten. Coming into the game, the 8-0 Buckeyes, led by All-American tailback Archie Griffin, had outscored their opponents 360 to 75. On defense, the Buckeyes were equally dominating, having surrendered no more than one touchdown in each of their last seven games. Michigan State, on the other hand, was a mediocre 4-3-1, including a 56-14 drubbing at the hands of UCLA. The game looked like a mismatch, but the Buckeyes knew firsthand that the Spartans were not to be taken lightly, especially in East Lansing. Michigan State was a different team playing at home than they were playing on the road. They notoriously are the spoiler. And man, if, we're, if they're in a position to, uh, to knock us off late in the season, which it typically is, uh, up there, they're going to do it. Two seasons before, the Spartans upset the Buckeyes, handing them their only regular season loss. This time, Coach Woody Hayes was so wary of the Spartans, he altered his team's usual practice routine. We did not prepare for Michigan. Uh, Woody couldn't afford that. In fact, I don't know that we ever prepared for Michigan during the Michigan State Week in any year. Still, as they took the field, the Buckeyes sensed trouble. The boos and the roar you just heard greet the Buckeyes. I remember feeling like things are not right. There was a sense in the air that, you know, I couldn't put my finger on it. I remember warm-ups for the game was really weird. The fans were really almost vicious. You can't hardly turn around, you can't hear, you. they're yelling at you, I mean, everything you can think of, you know, pressuring your parentage, you know, uh, everything that goes along with that. The bench seemed like you were in the stands. I mean, that's how close the fans were to the team. It's a nasty place to play. It's everything college football's supposed to be. The raucous home crowd seemed to boost the Spartans' normal level of play. We didn't expect them to be as good as they were. And quite honestly, they probably weren't that great of a football team because they weren't consistent through the course of the year. Uh, but they played great against us that day. It was a, it was a hard-hitting game from the get-go. They had still, to that day, had a reputation that uh, kind of like the Steelers used to be in the old days, as they lost all the games, but they always beat the bejeebers out of you because it was always a tough game. It was a tough, hard-hitting, I mean, every every time you got tackled, every time you hit, I mean, it, it would sting. But I can remember getting hit three or four times and thinking, those are the three or four hardest hits that I've ever had. And those came in that game against Michigan State. The Spartan defense, in particular, had come to play. Their physical style threw a wrench into the normally potent Buckeye machine. Numerous drives stalled. Field goals were missed, and turnovers, two fumbles, and an interception were killing the Buckeyes' attack. You can't turn the ball over, especially when you're playing away, especially when you're playing in East Lansing. Ohio State struggles in offense weren't their only concern. Their heralded Buckeye defense had been crippled by injuries, forcing them to adjust on the fly. I think I was playing corner at the time, which was a position I shouldn't have been playing to begin with, rather than playing my safety position. But because of injuries, they decided to shift me around. I think that uh, Timmy was probably one of the greatest athletes I ever played with, no question. Smart, tough, very competitive. I have always uh, loved and respected Tim because he's one of the few players that will play with pain. I had a separated shoulder on one side and stretch ligaments on the other side and a knee. So I could barely run and I could barely hit. And, you know, hindsight being 2020, you know, you take yourself out of the game. But I wasn't going to take myself out of the game. Playing with will and determination, the Ohio State defense was stifling. In fact, the Buckeyes dominated play. But a last second Michigan State field goal at the end of the half sent the teams into the locker room tied at three. 
The score was a shock to everyone except Woody Hayes. Woody was, was great in anticipating certain things during the course of the year. And I can remember him paying a lot of attention to the emotion of that game in 1974. He tried to prepare us for it, and, and still, no matter what he said, no matter what he did, we didn't understand what we were going to be facing when we went there. I can remember him throwing a picture, a plastic picture of water against the wall in our, in our meeting room, trying to emotionally prepare us for that game, trying to get us excited, uh, saying, hey, look, you can't take these guys lightly because they're, gonna, they're, just, they're just gonna knock your head off. And he used those exact words. Uh, what he knew what was gonna happen, but we didn't heed Woody's notice. Tied 3-3 at the half, the 1974 Buckeyes realized the hard-hitting Michigan State Spartans were trying to repeat their 1972 upset win. Any thoughts of easy victory had been abandoned. Most of those games that year, we were up 28 to nothing by the end of the third quarter at minimum. Um, so we, at that point, we weren't taking Michigan State lightly. I think Michigan State wore us down. The offensive woes that plagued the Buckeyes in the first half continued. Their opening second half drive stalled at the MSU two, and the Buckeyes were forced to settle for a second Tom Claven field goal and a precarious 6-3 lead. The score stayed that way until the fourth quarter when Ohio State safety Steve Luke recovered a Michigan State fumble. The sprint out by Baggett, and he comes up the middle of 30, fumbles, and it's Ohio State ball! The Buckeyes finally converted when Champ Henson's one-yard plunge capped a 44-yard drive. He gives to Henson, and it's a touchdown, Ohio! And they now have a 12-3 lead, and the Buckeyes take it in, finally! The extra point gave the Buckeyes a 13-3 lead, a margin that usually assured victory. If there was one characteristic of a Woody Hayes-type defense back at that time, or almost any time that he coached at Ohio State, it was that the Ohio State defense never gave up the big plays. If you're going to score against Ohio State, you're going to have to drive it and make it on a series of short gains. And it was pretty uncharacteristic of an Ohio State defense to give up the big plays. Yet in the last nine minutes of that game, Ohio State gave up two huge touchdowns. The first game with just 5.30 left when Michigan State quarterback Charlie Baggett Stun the Buckeyes with a 44-yard bomb to receiver Mike Jones. It was the kind of play the All-American Fox routinely snuffed out when healthy. But on this day, his injury-riddled body wouldn't respond. I saw it coming, you know, but not in time. And when I went to plant and do what I needed to do to run, just didn't have it, physically didn't have it. The play brought the Spartans to within four points, 13-9, and put them right back in the ballgame. Back on offense, the Buckeyes tried to grind down the clock. But as it had all day long, the OSU offense struggled to move the ball. Forced to punt, the Buckeyes turned to All-American punter Tom Sclodany, who delivered a 55-yard kick, which pinned the Spartans back on their own 12-yard line. The game was now in the hands of the Ohio State defense. On the first play, the unthinkable happened. The running backs are Jackson and Bays. It is Jackson, Jackson loose at the 30. He may go all the way. Jimmy Fox has a shot at him and misses him. He's going for a touchdown. Jackson, Levi Jackson goes all the way for a touchdown. Levi Jackson runs 88 yards. Uh... Now, who would have ever thought that anybody could do that against us uh, late in the game? Nobody never ran a touchdown against us like that before. I mean, not even 50 yards, let alone 88 yards. I still see Levi Jackson running down that sideline. You know, you keep a team in a game long enough, the momentum start changing and anything can happen. Jackson's run remains the second longest run ever against Ohio State. More importantly, it put the Spartans ahead 16-13. With just 3.17 remaining, the Buckeyes knew their national title hopes hung in the balance. What I did with, with the guys was, was get them in the huddle, give them a, something positive to think about, 
we're going to do it. We're going to score. So let's everybody get on the same page. Let's hold hands right now. We go with the play. Archie Griffin's 31-yard sprint to the Michigan State 40-yard line brought the OSU offense to life. With a sudden sense of urgency, the Buckeyes surge deep into Spartan territory. I wasn't very optimistic when we started to drive, but then as we marched and marched and marched, it, uh, obviously that momentum did build, and, and then with that, confidence started setting in. Once I kind of led the charge and everybody else started to rally around what I was saying, and um, then the plays start happening. From the Spartan six, fullback champ Henson drove the ball to within inches of the end zone. With Woody looking on and time running out, Henson tried again. Griffin, Henson, and Bashnagel are the running back. It is Henson forging his way forward to about the one yard line. He didn't get in, I don't believe. Counting, seven seconds. And are they going to give him a chance to get a playoff? Or had they? I was at that game and I was seated right on the goal line where that uh, play happened. And I'll never forget one official raised his hands, touchdown. Another official came over and went like this, no, no touchdown. The atmosphere was, was so electric in that stadium. I think the officials were intimidated, I really do. I think they felt as though they were almost afraid to make the calls the right way. After Champ Henson didn't get in, I'm running up and down the side, up and down from the right tackle to the left tackle, trying to get the guys up. It turned out later, I found that uh, these guys were holding our players down, which is the thing to do. <laughs> Why wouldn't you do it? I would do it if I was them. We was hollering at the referees, of course the clock was still running, and I was trying to get the urgency. Hey, there's no timeouts, the clock is still running. Get up, get up, and I'm calling the play. Patton one, I'm calling the audible all at the same time. They got to the line of scrimmage, the ball was centered, and it squirted between Cornelius Green's legs. Brian Bashnagel picked it up and took the ball into the end zone. There was just total confusion everywhere. I think most people, players and fans and everybody alike, was what really happened? I mean, did we win or did we not win? It took 45 minutes before the answer was known. The final seconds of the 1974 Ohio State-Michigan State game were so chaotic, even the officials were uncertain of the outcome. Nobody knew what happened at the end of the game. I'd never seen anything like it, and I don't think anybody ever had, and they may never again. It was eerie. Uh, the mood in the press box was one of disbelief. I think there was a stadium crowd that day of close to 80,000, and I'm gonna estimate that probably 40,000 of the people were still in the stands 46 minutes after time had expired, just trying to find out who won this football game. We were all in a holding pattern in the locker room for about 15 minutes because we thought we were gonna go out there and play that last play. I know that Woody was pretty adamant. He thought that we we at least should have had the opportunity to run one more play. Um, and he was pretty firm with that. He would not let us get undressed after we got into the locker room. We don't know what's going to happen, but we know it's not good. You know, a lot of times when Woody would uh, we'd get mad or get upset, it was an act. You know, Woody was a great actor, but he was mad this day for real. All of a sudden, the door opens up, and it's Wayne Duke. Big Ten Commissioner. I mean, he slinks into the room, you know. He didn't open the door. He kind of like opens it and like slides in, you know. And well, Woody's like steaming by then, you know. And we were told that Michigan State won the football game. And it was upsetting. You know, our guys were upset. Coach Hayes was upset. Uh, he was really upset. Woody had the commissioner of the Big Ten, Wayne Duke, had him by his lapels and had him had his feet off the ground and banging him against the locker saying, what do you, what do you mean, you know, you can't overrule this? Duke's official explanation was that time had elapsed before the final snap, but Hayes would have none of it. All I heard was this big crash into the locker, and I heard, we better not lose this game. <laughs> we better not lose this game because of that. Now, what are you gonna do about this, Wayne Duke? What are you gonna do about this? And finally, uh, Wayne Duke says, uh, 
I can't talk to you, you're delirious. And Woody said, you're right, I'm delirious, <laughs> and went after him. The thing that Woody hated more than anything else in life is when he felt like he was getting cheated of something. And it wasn't necessarily for his sake, it was for the sake of the team and, and the players. He just felt like he was getting cheated, that, uh, that it was the officials that were, were, that were cheating us. And, of course, you know how Woody felt about officials. One of the coaches coached, Coach, your heart, your heart, remember your heart. And he took his medicine out and threw it against the wall and said, well, I want to die. <laughs> there was no gray area for Woody. It was either right or wrong. And if, once he saw that, you know, we were on the right side of things, he could not understand why it couldn't be overturned and why we didn't win that football game. That's what I loved about Woody. Woody fought for us. Woody was extremely fair. I mean, he'd get down on you, he'd call you all kinds of names. If he felt like you were cheating yourself or cheating the team, he'd let you know about it. But on the other hand, if he thought that you were doing the right thing and giving the best effort, well, then he'd tell you about that as well. Well, games were exactly the same way as he would treat you as a person. And that is, if, you've gotten, if he feels like he's getting cheated, he's gonna, he's gonna go off the deep end with it, and he's gonna fight for us. He's gonna fight for all of us. Dissatisfied with the officials and the commissioner, Hayes decided to take matters into his own hands. So then Woody came into our locker room and tried to get a group of players together to go over into the Michigan State locker room to beat them up. We were, you know what, if we couldn't beat them on the field, we were gonna beat them in the locker room. He was ready to do it. I mean, the, the, uh, the uh, whole team, really. We had a bunch of guys ready to go. I was, hey, I was around, hey, I'll go. But uh, well, our cooler minds, everybody's cooler minds, including Coach Hayes, prevailed. And, and uh, we were upset. Can you imagine? Can you imagine Ohio State going over and fighting Michigan State in the locker room? <laughs> I don't know what that's going to do, but that's the old school move. You lose the game, I guess you're going to fight by now. But as much as the official decision seemed unjust, the Buckeyes knew that they deserved much of the blame. We put ourselves in our own, our own situation that uh, we should have, you know, never, never gotten ourselves into. Typically, we would not have been in a position in that game, in any game, where a long run like that would have would have beaten us. They were fired up for us, and, and, and I think we didn't take them as seriously as, as they took us. In spite of his protest, Coach Woody Hayes knew the final responsibility was always his. He always felt like he could have coached better, and he always questioned himself what could he have done better. And I really respected Woody for that. The 1974 Ohio State-Michigan State game also highlighted a strange irony. From 1972 through 75, Ohio State never lost to Michigan, but they lost twice to Michigan State. Probably when it's all said and done, that's probably the game that I would have feared the most if I had I known any of those games up in Michigan State. I would have feared the most if I had known what the results would have been. Every time I think about it, it makes me sick. <laughs> you know, because that, that was our game. That was our game. We were number one in the country that year. So, uh, yeah, that, that was a bitter pill to swallow. It, that hurt. And uh, it's the one that got away from us. Uh, but in order to have a national championship team, you've got to win those, and we didn't get that done. That game, you have dreams about that game. Uh, nightmares would be more appropriate, yeah, nightmares. The 1974 Buckeyes had little time to mourn their loss to the Spartans. Two weeks later, they faced Michigan with the Big Ten title on the line. Ohio State regrouped and beat the Wolverines 12 to 10 on the strength of four Tom Claven field goals. Claven's kick sent the Buckeyes west to a third straight Rose Bowl, their fifth in seven years. For Buckeye Classics, I'm Archie Griffin. Thanks for watching.